So I want to talk more about what makes the kernel special and how that's important for making processes. Someone asked at the end or after last class about how VirtualBox was working because um, they made the observation, which was quite clever, that you could actually run a VirtualBox inside VirtualBox, so run inside your host OS, a guest OS in VirtualBox, and another guest OS inside that, which suggested that what I told you at the end of last class about how it worked was not quite correct. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that. And then we'll look at how processes work in web browsers and look at what you're going to do for problem set two. And I'll show you, show you what problem set two should look like when you finish it. What is so special about the kernel? So what are the things that the kernel should be able to do that no other program should be able to do? I have at least one answer to this from last class. Yes. Yeah, so there, the kernel is able to see the kernel in a row, right? It's able to run even if other programs are running. So we've got one major resource to share. Right? We're trying to share the CPU, and the kernel has special access to the CPU. It can handle kernel timer interrupts. If a regular program was able to handle the kernel timer interrupt instead of the kernel, well, then that regular program could decide to keep running and the kernel would never get a chance. Certainly, only the kernel should be able to do that. Is there anything else the kernel should be able to do that no other program should be able to do? And this gets at our, so what are the two main things the process abstraction provides? We've talked about one, it allows you to share time on the CPU. And so you've got many programs sharing one processor, each getting some use of that CPU and feeling like they own it. What is the other main thing a process provides that allows you to share? Yes, memory, right? So the other thing a process allows you to do, each program runs, it thinks it has its own memory, and it doesn't interfere with memory of other programs. So if we're going to enable memory sharing, what does that mean about what the kernel can do that regular programs can't do? Allocate memory. So sort of on the right track, right? So you can write user-level programs that allocate memory, right? You've all probably done that. You've used C and done malloc, or you've written Java programs that create objects. So they are allocating memory. What's different about how regular programs allocate memory from how the kernel allocates memory? Yeah. OK, so what does it mean to say that a user-level program can only do things in its memory space, but a kernel can do everything? Who decides what the user-level program's memory space is? Yeah. So the kernel decides what the user-level program's memory space is. So what special power does the kernel need to have to decide what the user-level program's memory space is? Yeah. So this is something we're not going to get into a, a lot of detail today. But so at a high level, it needs to be able to see all the memory. Right? And it be, needs to be able to set up things in the processor that limit the memory that the user program can see. So that's the big thing that the kernel has, is it has access to control over memory in ways that regular programs do not. How does the hardware provide these things? All this is just running on some bit of silicon. Okay. So what does the hardware do to make the kernel have these special powers where a user level program doesn't? Good. So that's, that's getting at the abstraction we want to provide. Right? We're still sort of talking at a high level. Right? We're saying what the hardware does is let the kernel do some things that the user level programs can't do. And that's indeed what it does. At the, the simplest but most concrete level, what does that mean? So we've got this bit of silicon that's our hardware, right? And some programs running. What's different if it's the kernel that's running or a user level program? Think about how our program runs, right? All that's going on on the processor. Our program is just some instructions. There are instructions in memory. Here's our processor. Those instructions are going into the processor. It's doing some stuff to run them. And then it's going back and fetching the next instruction that's going in the processor. It's doing some stuff. And maybe it's sending messages out to memory and doing other. That's a very high level view of how the program's running. So if we want the kernel to have privileges that a regular program doesn't have, what do we need to do in that processor? So what happens when a user level program tries to do something that it shouldn't do? OK, so we saw one example last class. Good, right? So we saw when a user level program tries to read some part of memory that it's not allowed to. The processor will not allow that. It will give us a fault instead. Right? And that's 
jumping into the kernel for, for some time to handle that, but eventually we're just seeing the user program crash as a result. Okay. In general, what's happening, if there's an instruction that's special, there's some instructions that any program can execute. There's some instructions that you have to be special to execute. These are the privileged instructions that only the kernel can execute. So what the processor is doing, it's looking at the instruction. If it sees that it's a privileged instruction, it's not going to allow it to execute unless you're running as the kernel. What this means is that some instructions are privileged. Which instructions are privileged? Okay, so an instruction is privileged if only the kernel can execute it. And we've seen sort of an example with, with the segmentation fault last class. It's a memory instruction that is a, the same instruction might be allowed and might not. Right? It's not the case necessarily that all the privileged instructions are always privileged. But there's some that are always privileged. And then there are others that if you execute them with the wrong parameters, then it's going to lead to some, some failure if you're not privileged. How would you figure out what instructions are privileged on your processor? So if you, if you wanted to test your processor and figure out what instructions are privileged, could you write a user level program to do that? So you could write, write a program. You're not going to be able to write it in a high level language, but you could certainly write a binary that goes through all the instructions, or at least goes through all the opcodes, and sees if you can run them or not. And if you're a user level program, if it's a privileged instruction, you won't be allowed to. The easier way to figure this out is to look in the reference manual, or to look on Wikipedia or some more condensed place than the, the Intel reference manuals. But the Intel manuals are actually fairly readable, and they're free, available online. It's a huge PDF file that has seven volumes all in one. But you'll find a section there, if you read it up to page 2025, that tells you what all the privileged instructions are. And so here's the list. There's not that many. There's 16 of them, I think. And these are instructions that only the supervisor can do. If the user level program attempts to do these, the processor will not allow it. So what kinds of things do we expect those instructions to do? You may not be able to tell from the way they're described, like what does load the GDT and load the LDT register mean. What would you expect these privileged instructions to be doing? So remember the, the two things we said we needed to share. So we want to share the CPU time, and we need to share memory. So the instructions that need to be privileged are going to be instructions that control those things. So what these instructions are doing, right, all, all these instructions with the, the global descriptor table is the GDT and the local descriptor table. So there are things for setting up memory spaces. Later in the semester, we'll get into the details of how, how that works. But what's important now is to say, well, these are things that you need to do. In order to set a memory space, you need to be able to write into those registers. Because those instructions are privileged, only the kernel can do it. If these instructions weren't privileged, a user level program could set up its own memory space and start reading arbitrary locations in, the, in, in memory. What about these other ones? So there's some about control registers. So these are not about setting up memory spaces. What's the other really privileged thing that we should make sure that only the kernel code can do? OK, good. So this is, this is certainly part of it, right? So we said in order to share time well, we need to know that only the kernel can get these interrupts. What about? So what's going on with the, the control registers is, is not actually that. Um, that's an important thing to point out, that you know, part of what we're assuming is that only the kernel can handle these interrupts. And there must be somewhere stored in memory a table of where to go when there's an interrupt that only the kernel can write to. But what's the other really important thing? And actually, let me go back to my picture, not very good picture, of the processor. How does the processor decide whether or not a privileged instruction can execute? OK, so at some point, you've got a privileged instruction. right? It, it's something, let's say it's, it's that low global descriptor table function that only the kernel should be able to do. And your program that's running tries to run that instruction. And the processor has to decide whether or not to allow it to run. So what should the processor do? Yeah. So it's, got, it's definitely got to know whether an instruction is privileged or not. And it also needs to know how to execute instructions, right? So it, it doesn't have a high-level memory table to look in, right? This is sort of built into all the um, you know, billions of transistors on the chip, how to execute its instruction 
And so part of that would also um, potentially have know that it's privileged. But it's actually going to be even before that. But it certainly does need to know. Uh, it, you're, you're right that it needs to know whether it's privileged or not. But what's the other thing it needs to know? Yeah. Getting at the question of how does it know whether you can execute it? Right. So, so there's the instruction, right? So let's say we've got a privilege instruction. Now we've got to decide whether we're, we're allowed to run it. Right. And the processor needs some way. And you're talking about, well, it can be running in different mo modes. It can be running in kernel mode or in, in user mode. How does it know which mode it's running in? Is there some like switch you flip on your machine to say I'm running in kernel mode? Process number? Um, no, something simpler than that, yeah. Yeah, it's got some bit stored in the register that tells you what level you're at. And if a user level program could change those bits, well, that would be really bad. Right? So they're bits stored in registers, and that's what the control registers are about. There are bits in these control registers, and CR0 is, there are four control registers, but CR0 is the one that has bits in it that say, are you running in protected mode? Right? If a user level program could turn that bit to zero, well, then it can access all of the memory and do everything it wants. If the x86 is designed to be able to emulate, uh, actually, sorry, the, um, you know, Pentium and higher chips, uh, or all the x86 family chips are designed to emulate the original 8086 chips, I think even before that, that didn't have any of these notions of protecting memory. There's one bit in that control register that says, are you implementing any memory protection at all? So if a user level program could change that bit, they could access all of the memory of all of the machines. Right? And then there's also bits that control, that um, affect, given that you're in protected mode, are you running as the kernel or are you running as a user level program? So changing those values better be a privileged instruction. Otherwise, there's no point in having it. So those, those are the big things. And there's some other things that, that reading these performance counters seems like, well, that probably doesn't need to be privileged at the same level. But it can leak a lot of information to other processes. And so that's probably the reason why those things are privileged as well. Here's a picture of the state of the machine. And probably what you did mostly in 2150 was all about these general purpose registers. You're writing code that put values in registers, manipulated it, did loads and stores, went to memory, used these parts of the processor. The things that we're going to be really interested in and in this class are the things that you can't do in user level programs. Those are all just parts of the processor. There's nothing magic. It's just the processor designed to only allow instructions to manipulate those things if you're running privileged code. And one of those is this two bits here that tell you about the privilege level. So people will talk about having rings. You'll see diagrams like this of the protection rings. That's really just the value of those two bits in memory. Those two bits are zero, you're in ring zero, and you can do things that only the kernel can do. So there's nothing magic going on here. There's just a couple of bits in memory that the only one who can set those bits is kernel level code. And there's actually a, a little more than just the two bits in the register I showed you. But places that determine what ring the code is running in, and then depending on whether you have privilege or not, some instructions are allowed to execute and if you don't have enough privilege, they might not be. And almost everything, this is, this is for the x86, applications are all running in ring three. So if you're running your favorite web server, any browser, all of these things are all running as user level programs in ring three. Ring zero is the kernel. The rings between those are mostly unprivileged, but can do a few things that user level programs can't do. So things like device drivers and some operating system services might use ring one and two. What happens if a user level program tries to execute a privileged instruction, but it's a user level program, so it shouldn't be able to? So what happens? Yeah. OK, good. Yeah, so the processor is doing something, right? So it's checking whether the program that tried to execute that instruction is privileged. Now it's failing that check. So what happens after it fails that check? So what's going to happen is it's going to jump into the kernel. Right? So we're not going to necessarily kill the user program or blow up the machine or do anything like that. We're not going to allow that privilege instruction to execute. But the, what the processor is going to do is call into the kernel. Right? And now the kernel is going to be running in kernel space. 
and it has to decide what to do with that user-level program that tried to do something with a privileged instruction. 